happy Wednesday, everybody. Welcome back to Ribbon Candy Hooking. I'm Deanna. It's great to see you. It is Wednesday. I am sorry I missed you on Monday. We had such a thing over the weekend. We had so we had a very nice time uh, taking a day to go to, um, well, I went to Donna's the one day, um, you know, to drop off those rugs, and I made a post of it on Facebook. A couple of, a couple of girls from Rhode Island, from Chapachet, um, Mary Ellen and Paula are going to finish those three George Wells rugs. So that was, ex that was exciting. I think they are anyway, they're going to give it a try and they're going to let me know if it's not conducive to sanity. So hopefully it will be. Um, so I did that and I stopped at Donna's and chatted with her a little bit, got some stuff, got a beautiful Miller hook, um, pencil style. I'll show you that another time. But, um, yeah. And then we went on to Rhode Island and um, we had such a nice time at the pinball museum where we often go. But unfortunately, my my personal little yard goat called Jocelyn was fooling around in the parking lot on the way out. And um, I, I I pulled it out of her. I knew that she, I knew that she was doing a trapeze stunt on a rusty chain. I knew it was because there's nothing else in that parking lot. But she said, yes, yeah, she was um, doing like balance beam on a, on a rusty chain, you know. And she fell off and broke her arm. So on Monday we had to um, we had to go to get X-rays and all that. And I wasn't able to do the show because timing the timing just didn't work out. You know how they keep you there like you're a, you're a prisoner once you're in the once you're in the door. And now we've got to go for the ortho whatever orthopedic orthopedic's foot right. It's ortho something um, for I don't know an MRI or more stuff to see if they need to set the arm. But she is, thank you for the thank you for the questions and all the care that came in for her. She is my little doll. And they have a day off today. It's a holiday at our school. I think it's the last day of Ramadan, I think. Um, but she is not in pain. She's not, she is a pain, but she's not in pain. She's not in much pain. She's taking aspirin and she is, she's okay. It's going to be a continued thing. Um, but we don't have an appointment to do the next step until next Wednesday. I don't mean tomorrow. I mean next Wednesday, which will mean it's like closer to two weeks than a week and a half after she had the injury. And I'm thinking, what's the point? If you're just going through the motions so that we, you know, we keep going to appointments, don't bother. I was so rude on the phone yesterday because I said, if it's an emergency and it needs to set, it needs to be probably within two weeks of the break, right? Let's not be absurd. Um, but if you're just like giving us another appointment to make me happy, then just forget it, cancel it. Um, cause I'm, I'm, I'm going to assume that if she's supposed to be there, you'll get her in there within a reasonable amount of time. Oh, I sent a heck of a letter to her doctor last night. I haven't heard back yet. Sometimes man, I just, I, I go off my chain in a different way and it's usually not good. Mm. All right. Let's come back to the center here. Lots of puns. You see how many I got this morning. So good morning, everybody. It's great to see you. It is good to be back. I did not want to cancel again. I was scurrying to get my content together, though, because it has been some it has been some busy days here. And as you can imagine, with um, the kids having the day off, it's a lot. Oh, it's a lot, but it is nice. Robin, great to see you. Good morning in Wisconsin. Beautiful day there. Oh, it looks like it looks like it's sunny, judging from the emojis. I'm jealous. It's very overcast here, but very warm. Very warm yesterday first day that it was really warm and you know I had on my jeans and this top and I walked to pick the kids up at school and um I was by the time I got there I was complaining about the heat because it was 80 at that point unexpected it just in New England we just can't do things by halves you know it, everything has got to be full full blast or not at all so um and now it's cooler again today dropped 20 degrees or more more 30 but it's funny it's funny keeping us on our toes Melissa great to see you Oh, I love that card that you posted on your page this morning. So sweet. Good afternoon from New Brunswick. She is doing just fine. I know she's in pain. I know she is. And I would say, I hope that she's learned something from this, but I'm sure she hasn't. I mean, come on. This is Jocelyn we're talking about. She's up there right now playing. She's got her arm in a brace. She's playing Fortnite with her other arm. And she's got, uh, the room is so loud with the video game. And she's got her 3D printer on. She's printing crystals. Don't, I don't know why, right? Because they're not going to be like uh, glassy and glittery and lovely. Uh, they're going to be plastic. And this one is like a matte purple. But she's got a vision, so I'm going to leave her to it. It's fun when she does anything creative. Barbara, great to see you. Sunny day there too in Toronto. Great to see you, Linda B. 
more aftershocks. Oh, you're kidding. Oh, I didn't hear that. Oh my gosh, I didn't hear that. That was a crazy earthquake. What was that on Friday? Was that on Friday? Gosh, I can't remember. I guess it must have been, right? Oh, and then the eclipse. The eclipse was in between there too on Monday, wasn't it? Um, I guess I didn't understand that it wouldn't get dark here. <laughs> I mean, like I hadn't done, I hadn't done one of those total eclipses in my in my life, and or at least not here in the U.S. Right? Because there there um, there there's many uh, often, but like usually over the water or a different part of the world. So it's been a really long time since there's been one in the U.S. I w I wish now that I ha that I had really understood the event, and that I had been driving to. Um, Vermont in a traffic jam with everybody else because it seems like it would have been worth it. Nothing much happened here, but we were standing out there like fools with our glasses on and it was kind of cool, but it wasn't, it wasn't stay out there for like two hours or three hours kind of cool. It was just like, I don't think so awful to say, but I don't think I would have known that there was an eclipse if there hadn't been so much hype, at least here, because we were not in that band. Next time I'm going to chase the thing, right? If I'm alive in 20 years or whenever it's supposed to happen again. Kaz, great to see you. Good morning in sunny Wisconsin. Yep, I think she's mending well. Gosh, I don't know. I'll keep you updated. I'm hoping we can get in sooner. I'm hoping that fiery, well-worded message that I sent uh, last night um, hits its mark. Either that or she'll just ignore me and we don't get anywhere. But I'm telling you, I'm not going to start on the health system. But man, it's like you're literally your head has to be hanging on by a thread. Can't be your arm. It's got to be your head. Uh, otherwise, they just, you know, they see you when they see you. And they're so belligerent on the phone. That's what got me. This girl on the phone, Danielle, she was so belligerent and uh, difficult. And I said, you know, I would love for, um, you know, my daughter to get in there before her bone sets the wrong way, um, you know, between now and, oh, I don't know, death or like the next eclipse. And I think ah, it's better not to say stuff like that on the phone, but sometimes I just can't help it. I'm so triggered by um, the weird attitude that like you pay so much or your work does, but you st it's still you for insurance and um, and they treat you so badly. It's like you're, you're at the airport or something, you know? Gosh, it really gets me. Nature bound. Oh, you're also sweet asking after Joss. My two Cape Codder buddies are side by side in the thread there. Cheryl, great to see you too. I have some Cape Cod talk today. I have some sandwich glass talk today in our commentary. Rhodey and Woodland. Oh gosh, welcome. You are in St. John's, Newfoundland. Sunny but cold. Great to see you. Super big welcome to you. It's going to be a fun episode today. You know, I love these heavy history episodes where we talk about rugs and this is rug design. Um, in the opinion of uh, William, what is it? William, W.W., um, William something Kent, W.W., I want to say Randolph, but that's not, Winthrop, Winthrop, William Winthrop Kent. Sometimes when we talk about him, sometimes he triggers me with a lot of mansplaining, but he was a great historian and documenter of uh, er early thoughts about hooked drugs specifically. He was wrong on the origins, but he couldn't possibly have known that at the time. He did a lot of great scholarship, but so I have to give it to him. It's just the tone sometimes gets to me. You'll see what I mean. Uh, poor Joss, such a daredevil. We always had to be alert at the playground. Yeah, when she was like a little ant, I mean, she was a tiny little thing. She was doing the monkey bars and kids who were literally six or seven years older just watching in shame. I mean, she has, she has been, yeah, she's been a yard goat for a long time. She's been training for this for a long time. Can't believe it's her first break, to tell you the truth. Dave, spring has sprung in Toronto. That sounds fabulous. Oh, welcome. Good to see you. Happy Wednesday. I can't believe it's already Wednesday. Karen, good to see you. Good morning in Black Forest, Colorado. Happy Wednesday. Joyce, happy Wednesday in Pennsylvania. Good to see you. Sharon, you're logging on in Vancouver in the middle of spring cleaning. So much fun. Not, I, I've been trying to chip away at it bit by bit. Thinking about a yard sale, I started going through my, this is this is not super useful, but going through my books because we, we are such insane book people. But, you know, going through my books with the thought that I would get rid of some of them because we have a little library out front. But um, it's not exactly spring cleaning, is it? It's like, it's like the cherry picking of the spring cleaning. It's like, I'll have, I'll, I'll 
don't bring um, my coffee and sit by the bookcase for a couple of hours. That's not, I mean, that's what, that's all I've done so far. I really need to get going with the spring cleaning. Out of like two bookcases, I weeded like three books. Super, right? Super progress. Marilyn, great to see you. Beautiful day there too. Catherine, good to see you too in California. Sharon, I broke my wrist fighting with my brother when I was about Joss's age. My dad was pissed. And when he came home from work, we had to drive to the hospital. I, I guess these things, I would have been, I would have been really pissed if it was, if Teddy was involved, but he wasn't. Teddy's so, it happened in the parking lot while I was exiting the uh, pinball museum because we all kind of split up and we're making our way back to the car. And Teddy was already in the car because he gets overstimulated with his autism. And Joss came, if, it, having inherited the full blast drama queen insanity that I bring, right, when I'm not on camera. And she, she did her thing. And then she went, bonkers because she was in pain at that moment if you if you think about when you when you stub your toe right that absolutely it's like a wave of wet pain that almost knocks you out it's so it's so much uh must it must have hurt a lot but she went nuts and she started yelling at teddy uh to open the door so she could sit down in the car but she didn't want to sit in her seat she wanted to sit in his seat and man by the time i got out like one minute later he was almost in tears because he was like, oh, like so panicked. It's just too, it's too much for him, that kind of drama. He couldn't handle it, but he did his best and he called, he called me, but I couldn't hear him from inside the pinball machine. So I just kept saying, I'm on my way out. Like I was literally walking out of the building. Oh man, I'm telling you, she's, yeah. Every time I hear a boom, cause she's right above me. It's like, is everything okay up there? Oh man, Jessica, I love your new piece. I can't believe how far you got with the sign language piece in such a short time for your brother. That is such a gorgeous piece. Um, we'll look at that for sure next time on gallery time, gallery night. That is, it's just beautiful. I love the sign la language um, aspect of it too, because you're, it's your brother who's deaf, right? Not your brother-in-law, but your brother. It's so great. It, it's, ju it's just so symbolic, special, and just like you doing something that has to do with your family, another beautiful gift rug. It is just incredible. It blew my mind. Um, you are in Ohio. Gloomy weather there, but thankful that you had perfect weather for the eclipse. You had three minutes of totality. Oh, you're kidding. And it was mind-blowing. Oh, I'm so jealous. I'm, I'm so happy for you. And I saw, you know, I have to say, I saw it on the news. It's not the same thing. But it reminded me, not the same thing, definitely not as good, uh, not as much of a community thing, but it reminded me of touring caves like in England and how they take you down into the bowels of the cave and then they make you put all your lanterns out. They do this in Paris too, like um, under the streets in the catacombs. And um, man, when you put your lanterns out, it's dark, like you don't know what the word dark means. Like it's dark like there's not a word in English for the kind of dark that it is. It's, it's not the same as dark that we know or a no moon night or, you know, all the lights off. It's not that kind of dark. It's like instant panic dark. It's the weirdest, most instinctive, primal thing like, whoa, dark. So I got a glimpse on the news that in some places it was that kind of dark and it was like, ooh, all these weird things kick in, you know, that are like hardwired. Uh, but I'm sorry that I missed that part of the experience because it seemed very emotional and exciting and it just seemed really nice for people to be sitting out with other people and having this just bonkers, um, unique experience, unique, you know, in our lifetime and, and t for another 20 years, um, having this experience together with strangers outside. It's just, it, there's not, there's nothing like it. I can't think of anything like it. Um, so it sounds like it was an amazing event. Karen says, you're welcome here in Colorado in 20 years for the next eclipse. Totality, I will be there. I'm not going to miss totality again. Um, if I am in one piece, if I am, if I have totality, I will be there. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm going to remember that I do not want to miss that. Dawn, great to see you in Southeast Michigan. Great to see you. Olivia, hello in wait, rainy and windy Ireland. Oh, man. You got no glimpse of the eclipse. Looked amazing on TV. It they covered it really well, I have to say. I thought it was going to be like covering fireworks or something, where it's like, oh, I can tell they're pretty, but I can't really tell. With the eclipse, I mean, I, I you could see the whole corona. I mean, it was just incredible. They counted down like it was New Year's. It was really exciting. And then I went and put my glasses on and went outside, and I was like. Is this the eclipse? But yeah, you have to be in the band, right? You have to be in the magic band, right place, right time. 
So let's start our commentary. I just want to show you this because I'm going to post a video as soon as I get done. I was working on this yesterday. This was a very small project. Do you remember I got these little cutting boards? And Can you get that? Sorry. Done. I thought it might I thought it might be the doctor's office calling to bump me up. Uh, but if it was just one ring, it was a wind-up call for sure. So I got these little cutting boards that are quite thick, and I was thinking what to do with them. Well, I spray-painted this one. That was the back, obviously. Um, this kind of chalky pink. Like, it's a very cool pink. It's barely a pink. And the light coming through the window is making it hard to see. It's not, it's not as bleached and blanched as it looks. It's quite a um, little pink. It's a little bit of a pink. Anyway, I did this yesterday. This piece here, I recorded almost completely, punching the whole thing, um, punched it with wool, uh, with a traditional punch, not a mini punch. I worked on this for about, uh, well, less than two hours. I watched one and a half episodes of Diagnosis Murder. So I love Dick Van Dyke. I never get tired of him. But um, it was a very fast thing to punch. So I punched 90% of it, and then I flipped it over fixed the points of the stars and some things. You'll see this on video. And I added the fruits in the trees, like the little circles in the trees. Um, but I thought it was a cute small project. It's called uh, Pennsylvania Summer. And obviously it's a tribute to Magdalena Briner EB. And it is traditional punch. And in the, right, so it's not mini punch, although you could, you could get this as a kit, do the thing as like a mug rug or a coaster, right, because it's small. And um, use the cutting board for a mini punch if you wanted to, because it's a thick, it comes out thick. Mine is, you know, thick because it's wool and it's rug warp. So um, I was thinking about kitting it in monk's cloth. I have to think about it. Um, I did it on rug warp. So it makes for a really thick piece. But in the video, I also finish the edges. So in the video, I trim it down. I um, fold the edges. I stitch the edges down. I don't glue it. And then I show you how I choose. It's nailed on, right? Ain't no way this sucker is ever coming off. There's about eight or 10 nails in here, but they're tiny nails with tiny heads. I show you in the video. I nail it right on, doesn't go through. Nails are not that big, but nice fast project. Really two hours spray painting aside, um, maybe another half hour for the stitching and the nailing it on. And you know, I had it hanging. I was gonna put it in the kitchen because I thought it was a nice, um, yellow, you know, I don't have a lot of yellow stuff, but um, it's very bright yellow and bright orange. I think you'll see the colors better in the, in the video. But I put it up on the bookshelf with my books just as a place. And I thought, oh, it's a good like bookshelf, buddy. It looked really good on the bookshelf, you know. So, um, yeah, I was having fun with that. So that this is going to be available as a kit and just the wooden um, boards, the wooden little cutting boards are both going to be available later today on ribbon candy hooking. So I'll get that going. So it's not a live thing, but I do do it from beginning to end, including the finishing and the nailing it on. And I talk a lot about glue. If you wanted to glue it on, I talk a lot about that but because I'm not dissing the glue. Um, I just, I chose to do nails in case I ever change my mind, want to take it off and do something else with it. Um, but I talk all about why the reasoning, the pros and cons of using glue versus nailing it on because you are never in a million years going to see the nails in this thing in between. Oh, the green screen's on. Yeah. This always happens. Now that I have the green screen on, which is amazing, I can't figure out how to shut it off. Mm. But you'll never see those nails. They're deep. You know, I just boom, boom, boom. I chose carefully where I put them, but you'll see all that in the video. It was super easy. You know, I'm like a ding dong with um, everything. And it was super, super easy. Let me just catch up, Monique. It's raining there in North Yorkshire. Oh, I'm so sorry. You have your fire on. Oh, my gosh. Nice, cozy spring fire, right? Is it even spring yet? Can I even say that? Is it spring or are we still are we still in winter? It must be spring, right? It's April. A fire is nice any time of the year. I love them in the summer, too, in the evening. Why not? Olivia has her fire on, too. <laughs> Got to be cozy in this world, right? So, all right, one more sip of my instant coffee. I am loving this uh, hazelnut thing. Sure ain't coffee, but it is good. Now, William uh, Winthrop Kent wrote three books, right, in the 1930s, I think. So these are early books for us as rug hookers. We can only date rug hooking to 1937, to the 1860s, right? Um, that's as far back as we can go. So uh, using a hook anyway, right? Using using needles much further. But um, 
Kent wrote three books, very good hardcover, comprehensive books. Um, the Hooked Rug, um, I forget what the other two are named, but they all have rug in it, and they're they're really hook hook rug heavy, right? He was a collector of hooked rugs. He was a researcher. He was um, he was a great scholar of hooked rugs. He's got uh, 175 illustrations in this book, uh, with very few exceptions, and I'm going to show you what the exceptions look like because. He's got a couple color things in this book that for this time are pretty impressive. Things that you could pull out like a plate, like this one. It, it looks black and white. It's kind of a funny choice now I think of it because it looks black and white, but there's actually a little bit of light pink and light green in it. It is truly full color. It's a photograph. And I think there's one a little bit later, maybe. Um, but most, no, maybe not. Most of them are it's black and white, but they're beautiful images, right? And important images. It's really important that um, this part of our history as rug makers is shored up and it had to be done at this time, right? Because at, I bet you anything, I, I don't know, but I would bet anything that, um, and I, I hate to say this, but I bet more than, at least more than half of the rugs in this book are no more because of people throwing them out and just more years of use. So, um, you know, Kent is one of the first people who is really, has a lot of uh, sort of, is revering rugs for, for um, their place in the art world, right? Where they, where they it, like when we were looking at that Rosemont catalog, right? We saw one on the wall. It was like, whoa, that was the first instance I've seen somebody showing a rug on the wall as art. Um, he had this feeling in the 1930s, which is very early to be thinking about using rugs in a way that is not utilitarian. He, with his art background and his super upper class background and a lot of travel under his belt, he was looking at rugs uh, from the point of view of, of someone who uh, was knowledgeable about art and the history of art. And he'd seen textiles. He'd seen other things besides paintings. And, um, and so he was, he was a good person at, at the right time to be looking at the imagery and saying, I think this is what's going on here, right? And he's not always right because we don't have a lot of scholarship before him. So, you know, we're not getting historians going, oh, let's look at, let's let's spend a lifetime looking at this thrift craft. It just didn't happen. Rugs were utilitarian even in the 1930s. Very few people thought about them as anything else. Um, you know, people were interested in tapestries and things like that, but not rug making, not not homemade rug hooking. And thank goodness that's changed. And there were always exceptions along the way, but not many. So not enough to make the craft um, as large a craft as other thrift crafts, like patchwork quilting, right? So in this book, he's got quite a few chapters that are about history. We'll, we'll look at all three of his books in detail. We've looked at them a little bit um, here and there. We could definitely use another look uh, because, I mean, it really is comprehensive. What he's done... Um, in 1938 in in showing us pictures showing us rugs um, in black and white best you can do right without breaking the bank he's really he's he's done well he's done well he's he's filled in a lot of the holes so most of the book is about early rugs where he find them where he found them um, different kinds of designs broken into categories how they were made um, where you would get the colors from if you were going to do uh, not chemical dyeing, if you were going to do natural dyes, and um, tech, a little bit of technical stuff. So he, he gives us um, a lot of art, a lot of history, a lot of practical tips and information about cleaning them and keeping them safe. Um, and there is one classification designs, uh, classification of designs in America. I, He's very, he's very big at categories, and I am too, so I get that. He's, 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 uh, in his mind, it's important with so many pieces, right, to consider. Um, he's got everything in categories, which is super, super helpful. Uh, very well-organized books. Very astute um, commentary, too. But there's one chapter in the book which has always stood out to me, and we haven't looked at it together yet. So I want to look at that today. Because not every, uh, not every, this is not a how-to book, right? There's no how-to in this book. So he, he describes the how-to, but he doesn't um, show you. It's not that kind of a book. Uh, one chapter called A Hunt for Rugs in Canada. Like it really is, it really is a landmark book. This is all interesting reading. 
Chapter 10, careful collecting, using, cleaning, and repairing. But the rug chapter that I want to look at is, hold on, I should have marked it. it. Talks about There's a chapter on the variation of size, right, for different purposes. So cool. Scotch rugs. Yeah, I mean, he's just, and those are mostly proddy rugs. Okay, this is it. Chapter number 13. This is one that is just strange. It seems to me, oh, Glenda, great to see you. 70 degrees Fahrenheit, Beach Island, South Carolina. That sounds beautiful. Glenda, welcome. I'm glad that you're there. Sounds like a gorgeous day there. And Monique, you're right. It is perfect weather for you with the fire you're going in the UK, uh, in Yorkshire, to be to be sitting and working on an indoor pursuit. That is perfect. Dave, daffodils are blooming in Toronto. <laughs> Olivia, it's like winter in Ireland. <laughs> oh, no. Well, you know, the interesting thing about this chapter, it's a very short chapter, right? So I'm going to read it to you. Buttons is going to have to go outside if he can't shut his hole. Um, let me get the cover, the slip cover off. It's not the original. It's not a first. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't have thrown it on the floor. So in this chapter, uh, it's the second to last chapter of the book. And he's got some ideas as a scholar, right? He's got he's putting two and two together. He's got some ideas about how people originally got their ideas for hooked racks. So this is this is um, America focused, right? Because he still he still thinks that rugs, you know, hooked rugs originated in Egypt, like in or Scandinavia. Um, so the that the information isn't there, right? The research isn't there to say, well, yeah, yeah, rugs with pile and rugs with loops, but not rugs that are made with a hook, right? So he doesn't know that yet, and he can't possibly know that. So this that that is like neither here nor there. But um, he is interested in in um the evolution right so this is interesting thought because this is a thrift craft in 1938 it's interesting at all that somebody like him with this big artistic you know huge amount of academic um art history studying and traveling and uh practical work and collecting right um that he would be interested in so many different facets of rug history but he was and thank goodness he was because he wrote it all down and he put lots of examples in here. So let's read first and then I want to show you some of the examples he gives us in this chapter. Possible sources of rug design. It has already been said that the rug makers went to all sorts of sources for suggestion and the following plates have seemed to illustrate this so well that they are included here. We're going to look at those in just a second. If one wishes to learn something of the early date at which hook drugs were made in America, it would be well to read Gertrude De, De Wagers or De Wagers, uh, W-A-G-E-R, Excellently Told Tale. Okay, I know where we're going with this. I know where we, this is the woman who worked for Antiques Magazine for so long. I swear to God, he must have had a thing for her. Hallmark movie. Okay, so if you are interested in this subject, you should be reading Gertrude de Wagner's, uh excellently told tale of her grandmother's work on them. The latter learned dye making for rug cloth from her mother in Eastham on Cape Cod, one of my favorite places. That's where Fort Hill is. In 1778. That's the grandmother. This t That can't be the grandmother. Wait a minute. 1938. That can't be anybody's grandmother for her mother. Rock for mother in Eastham, in Cape Cod. Okay, so Gertrude's grandmother learned from her mother. Okay, I suppose that, I'm just doing the math in my head and thinking, wow, these are some long lives. So uh, Cape Cod, 1778. This takes rug making well back into the 18th century. Again, not with a hook, right, with a needle. Um, which is not an early date for Scotch and English makers, but fairly so for American. Gertrude de Wagner's article is in Antiques Magazine for June 1925 and is a charming picture of the process simply told, but so fully and well that one can visualize the older woman at this occupation, which fascinated her as completely as it did her grandchild, who so graphically describes it. We can almost see the girl running to her grandmother with a bag of old woolen pieces and observe the joy of the old lady at having them. Eastham was where Prince, 
the first governor of Massachusetts made his early home. I'm sorry, isn't the first governor of Massachusetts William Bradford? Okay, I'm gonna have to, I, I just have to know because I've always thought that I need to know if I'm wrong, doesn't matter. But um, Prince, it just says Prince, it doesn't say like someone Prince, uh, made his early home and planted his famous pear tree. And the site is near the present highway, uh, sorry, highway bend, not far from the Penniman Homestead. Okay, so that is at Fort Hill. Cape Codders will know that, right? That is on the current Route 6 after the Rotary in Orleans where the bay is on your right, like Pleasant Bay, and Fort Hill is on your right, right? That's this ancient area where Native people had these big rocks where they were like sharpening their knives on the rocks and things. And you're heading toward Provincetown, right? Straight ahead. And it's, this is on your right. So interesting. Uh, the Penniman House, he was an early sea captain and a very important character on Cape Cod. Beautiful, huge whale bones outside his door. I know mixed feelings on that, but I mean, we're talking about an early uh, 19th century house. Um, Penniman Homestead, a peaceful and beautiful location in a charming old settlement. Just the place where one might expect to find hooked rug making going on. So, so removed is it from the distractions and noises of modern life. No wonder that in this place it is possible to learn how to make such harmonious patterns without black outlines bordering the various details of the rug. Ooh, strong opinion on the black outlines. But, well, this is, I mean, this is classic if you think about Art Deco era rugs, 1920s, 1930s. They are outlined, right? Because everything was very graphic in the Deco period. So Kent obviously doesn't like that, or at least he likes a more mellow look with his rugs, right? So um, patterns, black outlines, but with tones and shades of color that even in, photo in photographs melt together and show us now how nearly the aged and enthusiastic worker equaled the effects so sought by the most inspired rug makers of Eastern Persia. Making some leaps over here, but let's keep going. If some if someday Americans in, in the United States or Canada should quite equal such work, it will be attained not by machinery, but by manual work akin to the old time method of making the hooked rug. Well, that is quite beautiful. Yeah, you see, I always forgive him in the end because he does, he always does this great summation where it's quite beautiful in the end. John Winthrop is the first governor per Google. Yeah, I don't know who, I'm gonna have to check who Prince is. And again, it just says Prince, like the singer. <laughs> Wouldn't that be creepy if it was like a Dorian Gray story and he actually meant Prince? Uh, I think I'm not, right? Misinformation, just joking around. All right, so let's look at... Um, Hold on, let me find, okay, right here. I got so many slideshows for us, it's crazy. Let's look at our first image. So um, I'm showing you all of the images that he shows in this chapter. Let's together consider uh, his, so his argument, that was it for the chapter text. Let's look at his, I'm not gonna say argue, argument in the literal sense, right? He wants to show you his proof for the claim that he's making, that the following things that we're about to see, the following categories of art um, are, indeed the inspiration for the first American, North American uh, original hooked rug designs, right? I'm just taking a sip of my coffee. <laughs> Thanks, Melissa. So first one, here we are, border patterns. And he, and this is from Antiques Magazine. So he, he really, um, he really owed Gertrude a lot because I think everything I think every single image, maybe with one exception in this chapter, is from Antiques Magazine. So Gertrude did the really heavy lifting on this because it's almost all uh, images and then that small piece of text. So his first example, courtesy of Antiques Magazine, border patterns, showing forms akin to those used on hooked rugs and possibly derived from oriental rugs and pattern books for embroidery in Germany and France. So let's look at this together. I agree. Now, let's not think about Edward Sands Frost or, um, or, or Garrett Blue Nose or any, you know, any of these early 
um, rug, commercial rug designs in the U.S., right? Let's just think in general about rug design and where uh, if you were, you know, working for Blue Nose and, and working on a designer heirloom or one of these early companies, um, and you were intending to make an original design, where would you, where would one get their inspiration? What would you be looking at? So he's suggesting um, something like this, border patterns, right? Border patterns come, Thomas Prince, Karen, let me ch I gotta check, I gotta check this, hang on. Thomas Prince was a New England colonist who arrived in the colony of Plymouth in November of 1621 on the ship Fortune. In 1644, he moved to Eastham, where he, where he um, I can't see if there's a word after that, found, where he was found uh, returning later to Plymouth. Um, that's, re that's very good, Karen. I'm gonna have to check him, I'm gonna have to check him when I go to the Cape, which is like twice next month. That's really interesting. Thomas Prince, he was a colony governor for about 20 years, okay interesting interest that is really in i love i love this part of the history particularly on the cape because i'm i love the cape so much um and i love i love the connection between the pilgrims landing first at provincetown off provincetown at corn hill and stealing the corn that the native people had stockpiles there to get them through a winter um and they you know they were all hidden under husks like a giant mountain in the and the um, people from the Mayflower, the women stayed on the boat. The guys got off. The women, the women stayed in the water, right, in the shallow water, and did laundry, which they hadn't been able to do for you know dogs' ears, not years. It was months, but still, dirty. They were super dirty. Um, and at that time, there was like sh sharks, whales, everything right in the water, really close to the shore. There they are doing the laundry, and the men get up on the shore and they find this um, mountain of corn, and they didn't know what it was, right? Because it's like indigenous to North America, corn. But they figured it was food because why else would they be saving it? Uh, and they stole some and the arrows flew for the first time and um, the, the, the men from the Mayflower ended up beating a fast retreat back to the Mayflower, Mayflower right? Wh whose mast had broken on the way over and was, was gone after this journey. But um, they got back there and then the boat kind of limped to Plymouth because it was a really bad start. Um, but that whole history, because because that was the first start, that whole history around Cape Cod really is the first landing of the pilgrims. It's just they didn't stay there because it was a really bad start. You know, fight, fighting, right? Fighting before they've even like gotten gotten everybody off the boat, um, having an actual fight, and then they ended up in Plymouth. But there is that great history there, and along the shore there, if you're familiar with the Cape, it's. There's beach after beach after beach. First Encounter Beach is where the beach was that they landed. It's a beautiful name for a beach too. Thanks, Karen. That was really handy. That's such interesting. Um, that's such interesting info. I'm gonna have to assimilate that and do some adventures when I get to the Cape. So border designs. I would go for this. I would go for this. Um, border designs showed up in books, right? So people shared books. Libraries had books. Um, you could look at books with plates. Right? And depending on the age of the book, the plate was hand-drawn or it was printed, right? If we're talking about the 19th century, it was printed. So you could look at uh, books of plates that would just feature border designs, right? This existed. This wasn't like, you know, one person had it. It wasn't like, uh, you know, Gutenberg made one and that was the end of it. No, these books existed. Patterns existed because a lot of people did handwork. And in those days, ideas for handwork and line drawings for handwork work crossed over a lot more than they do nowadays. We hardly ever say, oh, I'm gonna use my cross stitch pattern to do a hook drag. It, we hardly ever say that, but we could. Oh, Kathy, good to see you. But we could, but in these days, you know, they didn't have as much media. They didn't have as many patterns, uh, you know, pass it, passing their faces. So when they saw something like this that was a line drawing, you'd be very inclined to take as many motifs out of it that you liked as you could. And you'd be very inclined to jam the motifs together. So that was a, that was an illustration showing you, somebody's mowing their lawn right outside. I hope you can't hear it really loud. It's in, incredible. Um, the window's shut too. That was a, an image of a um, drawing, right, for a pattern, for a border. This is actually a border of a Persian killam rug. And this is an 18th century rug that dates back, obviously, to the 1700s. So you can see it's quite threadbare, literally. 
big border, right? Big border and a much more Persian motif. Um, I'm so sorry about that mowing. I could, I could never plan for such a thing. Another example of, well, this is a 19th century um, rug. I'm not sure where it's from. It might be a Persian style rug. It's an Eastern style rug at any event. But um, really large, right? Full size room, floor, rug. These are the styles of rugs that we're looking at that are coming out of the East, right? Oriental rugs. But uh, very few people in the United States can afford them in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, right? Luckily in the 19th century, we're building our own mills and we're making our own rugs and we're basing the patterns on things we like, like existing rugs, right? Oh my God. I'm wondering like, is he actually in our yard? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going. I have to assume um, he will move on. So let's look at the next. Okay, wait a minute. I didn't want to show you that yet. Okay, hang on. He's really distracting me. Okay, um, embroidered carpet. Oh, okay, I see. I have this in the wrong order. All right, so let me show you this next. Um, yeah, let me show you. Let me show you the embroidered carpet. Let me see if I can find this one next. I have them in the wrong order. I don't know how I did that because I loaded them in the same order. Let me see. And then let me show you some examples of an embroidered rug. Hold on just a second. Let's see, don't peek, do, do eyes closed. No, 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 don't peek. Close your eyes, close your eyes. Oh, come on. All right, hang on. Hang on, we're getting there. Nope, nope. Yes, okay, nope, still not right. All right, maybe I lost that one. Let me just show it to you because I'm gonna accidentally show you the whole dangy slideshow. Hold on one second. Uh, I'm gonna come back here because that's what I mean to do. I don't know how, this one's in there somewhere. We'll see it later. Looks like this. So that's his, That's Kent's next plate that he's showing you, right? First the borders and then this is his next, God, that was loud. This is his next big idea from Antiques Magazine, part of an English embroidered carpet, 1560s, 18th century, worked in cross stitch and chain stitch. Note the similarity to hook drugs of early date. I think he's absolutely right about that, right? Where'd you go for inspiration for a rug? To a rug, right, to another rug. So in this area, let's see, I put in some uh, other embroidery inspirations from the same time period, right? So if we're talking about the 18th century, this is an 18, this is an 1800s German sampler. So we're looking at the kind of needlework, much smaller scale, right? Germans have this great heritage of including in their samplers stitches. So I, I don't mean just uh, motifs, like a flowers, the wreath, all that stuff, birds, fruits, but actual stitches, right? If you look at the bottom, it's, some of it looks like Bargello and long stitch, right? Uh, different kinds of actual stitches. So um, English and American samplers tend to be more about, you know, schoolgirl samplers that comes from the tradition of schoolgirls learning them and practicing their alphabet at the same time, right? Two birds with one stone. But German samplers and needlework has a tradition of actually functioning as a sampler where you're sampling, trying out small areas of different fills with the thought that you might want to use them uh, for something bigger, right? So German samplers are really um, in a league of their own. Um, sometimes they're called Berlin work, but we're gonna come to that in just a minute. Monique says, I have some lovely vintage pattern books from France I found, <gasps> oh, I found on the village market stalls, mostly for embroidery, but the designs um, could be for rugs. Monique, that's such a good find, such a good find. Um, th these are great things to look for, and this is like spreading the word. When you're out at yard sales, at markets in France, uh, at old bookstores, with old magazines, things like that, grab old, old textile anything, because those patterns, you can use them for your rug design, if you like designing, right? You can use them for that. You'll see a lot of parallels and crossovers. Um, somebody just started, I'll show you this on Friday, because I think on Friday I'm gonna do like, the cocktail night is going to be all samplers, right? Which is different for us, but kind of like a cozy night, just looking at samplers through the centuries. 
um, but somebody, I, I'm never going to think of her name, but I'll show you Friday, started publishing these books um, that are kind of print on demand. They're small, very particular, no text, but they are collections of uh, cross stitch, lace making, uh, pattern designs from the different centuries. So she's got like 14th century, 15th century, 16th century, 17th, 18th, 19th. I mean, it's really cool. I, I got three or four of them. And like I said, there's no text. It's if you want to recreate a historic um, textile. But for me, I'm thinking, ooh, I want to think about how to translate those into rug making. But Monique, it is so much fun to find stuff like that. It's such diamond in the rough moments, right? So this is a gorgeous uh, 1800s um, German sampler, right? And you could see if somebody had this in their house, brought this with them from home, you could see some of the motifs in here, the uh, vase of flowers, the fruits, the birds, the fl flowers, wreaths, all of this. These are motifs that we see in rug making, right? Very valid point. Now this is from 1618. This is a piece of black work. This is also German. I have a hard time believing this is actually 1618, but that's what it said on the page. I found it like on Pinterest or something, but um, it's in it's in pristine condition. Of, it's I don't want to be a doubting Thomas, but it could be. Uh, it's just in pristine condition. It's a beautiful motif, but it's German, um, and again, it's said to be 1618. Another example of embroidery. Um, here's another example of embroidery. This wasn't dated. Um, I would, I would say this is um, Western European, Scandinavian, I mean, my guess would be 16th century. I think this is a little bit older, just judging from um, the motif and the clothing, right? It's supposed to, I think it reflects an even earlier time, but um, I don't know what's going on here to tell you the truth. It's, I, I thought I saw bagpipes. Um, I think I see a, a sword, but who knows? There could be, there could be something awful happening here. I thought that was like a, um, pestle mortar pestle kind of thing on top who knows but this is a really old um, embroidery and it's certainly in the medieval style I don't know that it's like I, I don't know that it's like 1300s 1400s but it could be 1600s it could be 1500s it's hard to say with no information and looking at a photograph from this distance it'd be helpful to look at the stitches and stuff right but really cool motif beautiful border right you can see how looking at textiles from this period people would say oh that gave me an idea. Hang on, I got an idea. So, interesting. Um, this is another example. This is um, this is this is uh, a French textile. The date wasn't noted. I would guess it's a Victorian piece. It looks like it's all chain stitch. Um, I'm not sure how much of it is loomed or whatever versus all handmade. Hard, very hard to tell. Um, it could be all handmade, but I mean, really complex and lovely piece of embroidery. And does this look like a rug design? Does this look like the center of a rug design? It absolutely does. To Kent's point, another um, example of um, 18th century French embroidery with silk, right, with a needle. Um, to Kent's point, all of these things look like they're the inspiration for rugs. Absolutely, this is the center of a hundred Perlma gown designs, without a doubt. Was she looking at embroidery for, well, she might have been, or it might have been like um, the, the telephone game, right? Like she was looking at somebody who 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 was looking at this, right? Originally, it could work like that too. Um, nothing new under the sun, right? This is the image I was looking for earlier, sorry. This is the image with the embroidered rug. So you have it close up in the show in case you wanna pause on it later. I think he's making a really great point, a very valid point. Um, this is another textile from um, England. Um, I think this is a uh, 17th, 18th century textile, but lots of strawberries, right? Really, really lovely. Making the point, I'm trying to make the point, not super subtly, that, um, you know, I'm going to say it. I'm going to say something naughty. If it weren't for cultural appropriation, we wouldn't have any designs at all, right? We wouldn't have any designs at all. All of the designs we just looked at, I think he's absolutely right, were um, German designs, English designs, French designs, I think Scandinavian. Um, yeah, looking at other people's stuff and going, oh, that's pretty. I'd like to make something that looks like that. I love it so much. Without that, we wouldn't have any art anymore. We would just be looking at the same, passing around the same pictures over and over. So this is another lovely example of embroidery from, you know, pre-hooked pre rug period. 
incidentally, this is a Wilton rug. So we can date this rug to, so this is an English carpet, 1830. Um, and even with this one, you can see it, this, the photo is clipped a little bit, um, just the way the photo was taken. But we can see where 20th century design is going to go, it, rug design, because this is mixing both what Pearl McGowan called the ethnic pattern in the center. Right? That's not really recognizable to us. That is definitely an Eastern European slash Asian um, design. But the floral, right? It's a real hybrid between the worlds. It's a real hybrid. Um, so dating this to 1830, this is a manufactured carpet, Wilton, made in England. But you can see the, the mixing of motifs, the number of borders that are in place, right? That this is what becomes popular. Now, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think over the years, we have become, um, you know, as, as culturally, socially, we have become uh, pretty bland in our tastes, right? Like the more, like if I look at magazines, uh, with very few exceptions, the more your house or the property brothers looks like a hospital, the better you're doing, right? But back in this day, um, having patterns and uh, that with lots of lots of color in one rug, and then different colors in the wallpaper, different colors in the drapes, different you know pictures. Like it wasn't themed. You know, you didn't go to a store and they would sell you twenty books that had green uh, covers on them. That really irritates me so much. But it wasn't that kind of a world, right? It was a much more colorful world, ironically. So, oh, let me catch up on the comments. Uh, Monique says, um, beautiful to have a rug with chain stitches. Yeah, those embroidered rugs are so beautiful. The needlepoint and the embroidered rugs, because those are different. Both made with needles, but those are different. Um, and they are gorgeous to look at, the super, super fine detail. It's so related to what we do, too. Um, and Judy says, so are the chain stitches made with a needle. So are the chain stitches made with a needle or something more like a crochet hook? Um, like timber work or only through um, um, a stupid hearts block in the comment, a, a something thick backing fabric. Judy, it depends on the scale. So if we're talking like tiny, tiny, tiny scale, scale, it's done with a needle. If we're talking larger, it could be done with more like a tapestry needle. Wouldn't be done with a hook, but you would have to use a tiny, tiny, for some of the chain stitching that I've seen, not necessarily on rugs, but in embroidery, when I went to the um, Weathersfield, that, that Silas Dean house, and they had those really pretty, there's a bunch of 17th century um, embroideries and bed covers and things like that down on a table for us to look at. Um, the chain stitches in that case, I mean, I couldn't see them with my reading glasses. Like I couldn't see the individual chains. So they were definitely super, super fine needle. But then there were some examples of rugs that they had where the chain stitch was much larger. Um, I would think it would be just a larger needle. I don't know. I know it does transition into um, machine made stuff, right? Like you're able to make chain stitch and do all these embroidery stitches, um, st I think still before 1900, but in a factory. So it transitions that way. And now we see a lot of the, you know, the pashmina shawls and stuff. They all tend to have, if they have embroidery, it's that flat chain stitch, but it's not really a chain stitch. It's embroidered on in the least expensive way. So it wouldn't be the same um, sort of chain that we see on carpets from that period. But they're still doing the same stitches in different ways with faster machines and cheaper machines now. So we're seeing the worst of it all watered down at this point. I'm gonna have to learn more about embroidery. Um, I'm gonna be thinking about that question though, particularly if I go back to that Silas Dean house, because there was a textile person there the, the stuff that we were looking at that was chain stitched, a lot of it was like Persian. Um, and she had a lot of good answers. And um, yeah, maybe, I, maybe, I, maybe I'm due to shoot back over there. Um, Maureen says, it seems like a craft for rich people only. People can use rugs that are, yeah, I mean, it really was. It really was. It, it, anything like this, right? Because originally, like we're, we're talking about like the Elizabethan period, you know, you have to be like royalty or, or landed gentry to be able to say, can you make me a tapestry? People in France, can you make me a tapestry? It wasn't for everybody at all. And, and you know, people of lower classes, they didn't, they would not, they had, they had small accommodations, right? Even if they lived in the country cottages, they would not be able to put some kind of a loom or something into their house. 
very few exceptions, right? There are exceptions where we see people with small looms and different styles of looms making homespun in the U.S., in England, doing weavings and things like that. It's few and far between because most people can't accommodate. I can't accommodate any size of a loom in my living room still, right? So it was a rich person's craft because most of these things were commissioned. And you could even say what kind of materials you wanted. I mean, Queen Elizabeth the I, I mean, all of her stuff was gold, actually made from spun gold. And then there were all kinds of rules, regulations, and actual, actual laws about finery and what materials you could use to make a gown or curtains or a, bed, a bedspread for somebody. Um, and it, it depended on your class, right? Socially, people have a, a long history of push, pushing each other down as far as they can and as much as they can so that they um, look more opulent and exciting and better. Um, but yeah, it's, it's always been a rich person's craft. Uh, Marilyn says, I love all of the different patterns and colors in my house. When I went for a carpet, I couldn't believe how dull everything has gotten. It's so true. It's so true. And there's this thing that has changed culturally. And I have to say, I feel the same way. But when I buy something, um, not necessarily a rug, but material to make curtains or something like that, I do think, is it going to match? I do. I have that thought. I think that years ago, people didn't have that thought. They just thought, I like it, right? And once in a while, you get a standout Victorian decorator who's like, I did this whole room in green. It's the Garden of Eden. But for the most part, it was like, that's pretty. I'll take that. Or what's on the market stall? I'll take that. And we've gotten to a place now, and I think it's because things can be manufactured so inexpensively that we can make decisions at every turn. And you could say, well, you know, I've been wanting a green rug, but that's sage green. And I was, th I was thinking more of a pistachio green. You know, we've gotten into these like, you know, first world crazy conversations on a regular basis, but it's because we are spoiled for choice at this point. Um, and nobody was spoiled for choice back in the day unless you were wealthy. And then you would say, yes, do it in that wool. Make my tapestry or my rug in that wool, but make it the pistachio. And they would say, oh, God, of course we're going to make it the pistachio. Of course we are. Um, yeah, times have really changed. Olivia said, remember I told you before my mother would only buy Axminster carpet on the stairs um, with the best underlay. As Axminster uh, would say, your carpet would only last because of the quality of the underlay. That was a good marketing thing for sure. I mean, I know Axminster carpets are a big deal uh, in England. Um, I didn't know that until I got into rugs myself. But um, I, I know that now that they are like a big, big name with a lot of weight. Interesting, isn't it? Really interesting. I'm not going to get that far today. Um, I knew that this was going to be like that with this chapter because he's talking, he, he's going down a bunch of rabbit holes with this chapter. He gives us a little bit of text and then he's like, now, now let's really talk. So in this case, he's saying, all right, what do you think about this? Is this a possible inspiration for early rug design an old blue wear plate and he courtesy of antiques magazine and he writes oh no way i'm just looking it's owned by uh l earl Rowe. earl Rowe. oh oh i think i think that that is also the author of a series of books on early new england um hi histories i'm sure i know that name oh how interesting is that he writes, such a floral border is conventionalized sufficiently to fill well the proper spaces. The blossoms well placed for emphasis and balance. Starting with these, it is natural to, to introduce flowers from the worker's own garden. So in other words, he's saying, yeah, once you get going, you can customize it. Uh, this is from New, uh, New York from Brooklyn Heights, designed by Tom, period, designed by Tom. Guy, maybe this is a maybe this is a 1938 typo. Tom Guy Wall or Guy Wall, and made by Stevenson. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but that is the attribution. So he's showing us this um, particular plate as an as an example of spode wear, right? So so um, we are going to talk more about plates. We're not going to get to it all in this particular episode, but spode, right, is is English China. And we do see, with the advent of the technology to do transfer designs onto China. Okay, do you have pants on? Okay, 
let's just take a quick break to see to see the invalid you know i gotta give it to you i got it you come on camera everyone was asking about you she made crystals on the 3d printer and i gotta say just they're prettier than i thought they're like metallic good job which one's, your favorite? Which one's my favorite um that one is impressive they glitter a little bit too the 3d printer does amazing stuff is it wrong to say they also look like french fries or is that just me being hungry for lunch i kind of like this one the tiny this one? is I kind of like the tiny one these are nice little sculptures hun you did really nice what do i do with them um well they're art right so you put them on the shelf you put them on the shelf um do you want to tell everybody how you're feeling you got a lot of sympathy beginning of the episode you got your arm up like in a sling thing ah! <laughs> what is happening to me she's a ghost she's a ghost what is this the ghost of jocelyn joan it's Wait. the it's the stupid green screen all right let me finish the episode hon no 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 uh -huh. off she goes off she goes no see you later love you I so um i'll figure it out later so the idea of using plates as design is kind of a funny one and a bit of a convoluted one because if you think about it, a plate, at least a spode plate at this period, is a copy of something else, right? They've copied like a floral illustration or um, like a plant in some kind of a scientific whatever a digest illustration or a piece of art, right? Like a painting. They can they can tr they can transfer. Uh, whole paintings in monochromatic color schemes, right? So to say that it's copied from a plate rather than a painting, maybe. Plates are obviously more common than paintings. So using this next one for an example, oh, well, here's another example of um, Spode. Wait a minute. You know what, this, let, this, hold here for one second. I just wanna go a little bit further with this and say, I think that this design is by Sir David Wilkie. I'm not sure, but I think it is. And I think I have, he's a famous uh, British artist, right? From the, um, he was born like in the maybe middle, middle, I wanna say 1770s, 1780s, and he died something like 1860s, that kind of timeline. Um, hold on, let me see, hold on. I have one more, yep, this one. This is definitely, this is definitely um, a blue china plate. Like it's just, he just says old blue uh, Anglo-American china plate, especially good border designs and blah, blah, blah. But this is a copy of a painting called The Errand Boy by Sir David Wilkie. And it's interesting because look at how exact it is. Sir David Wilkie was really into, this is one of his paintings. He was really like Dickens, like into social justice, and he loved a good uh, sort of misery scene, uh, a good sort of poverty scene, um, happy, happy and poor, right? This was like, this is what he did. This is one of his only outdoor scenes, but you see the style of architecture here. Uh, the houses, we're looking at like Cotswold style cottages, right? Oh, not yet, not there yet. So if we come back to this design, right, you see a little bit of architecture like the painting we just looked at definitely um definitely the errand boy and then we see coming back here right so this is this is an example i found that's not in the kent book um by the way i'm sure you're getting it that the the examples that i'm showing that are black and white are from the kent book and then i'm filling it with other examples just to give us more context right so this one is uh, is one that i added it's another blue wear i don't know who the maker is but it is the same kind of thing as a Wilkie, right? Because it's the, it's not, we're not looking at an Asian motif yet. We're not looking at Willow. We're looking at an English landscape and we're looking at country churches that are way more recognizable as like the UK than like something more exotic. So interesting for, for Kent to be making the point um, that people are looking at pictures on their china, plates, uh, terrines, stuff like this, for getting great ideas for rug designs. It's interesting, but I actually think he's making a good point because uh, how many people at, you know, in the 18th, 19th century, America had paintings hanging on their walls? Probably very precious, precious few. How many people had prints hanging on their walls or rather pinned to their walls? More. Um, how many people had nothing on their walls? Probably most. So, the thought that somebody would be consulting um, dishware 
as opposed to an actual image you know even if it's the same thing even if you have a print of the errand boy on your wall and you've got the plate at the dinner table the plate is probably the thing that you would notice the the most right and you'd say oh i think that i like that design you know of the of the little boy going to the door of the of the old guy and uh oh that would make a nice rug right so he's got a great point whatever you're looking for whether your dishes have country scenes in them or lots of flowers and borders you're looking at them quite a bit hopefully if you're eating and um and thinking that's an idea for a design right because not everybody has a lot of original designs in their head floating around most people need inspiration and looking at things gives you inspiration very few decorative things in 17th 18th 19th more in 19th century america right industrial revolution and lots of imports at that time but until then precious few so you're looking at the stuff you've got and thinking oh this this would make a this would make a nice rug design it's the cover of the book but um it's funny because there's like a, a prominent swastika on the cover of the book too because of course that is a victorian symbol and until the 1940s that wasn't a problem but this book was written in the 1930s so um yeah interesting but he's making some great points we'll just have to come back to these great points i i love that there is a chapter in this book that where he's kind of brainstorming and it's it's a very um interactive chapter for kent because normally he talks at us but in this chapter it's like huh do you what do you think do you think that these could be ideas for the you know wh what people were looking at when they came up with rug designs interesting it's much more conversational than the other chapters in the book which are still have huge merit and we'll look at all of them i have to think about what we're going to do on friday if we're going to go to samplers or if we should keep looking at maybe we'll conclude with the when i say conclude i have the other two books too maybe we'll look at kent let's do kent this friday we'll finish this conversation We'll look at some of the other chapters that had really sort of compelling um, topics and subjects. And we'll do that for gallery night on Friday. Let me just make sure that nothing's going on. Oh, I shut my phone off. Um, I think we're good. I think we're good for Friday. And, uh, and then we'll look at, I've been collecting books on samplers too. And there's so many things I want to share with you in those because again, so much great crossover, right? That's what this whole episode has been about. Um, I think, I hope she saw your comments that those crystals, the crystals came out very nice. What should I do with them? I don't know, print some more, and then I'll have to buy some more of those reels so you can make some more, right? It's like never ending circle. It's the snake eating his own tail. Uh, Maureen says, that would be a great rug challenge. Make a rug based on your favorite plate and then show the completed rug and the original plate. That's a great idea. That's a great idea. Because even if your plates are white or um, fiesta wear or solid, whatever, you could still like look something up in, on the internet or go to an antique store. I know at antique stores, I always see plates. And I think, oh, I would love to have this set. And they're, it's not even that they're expensive often. It's just bringing breakable things into the house right now just doesn't seem like a good idea, you know. But I see them a lot and I photograph them a lot, sneaky, at antique stores. It, that's a great idea. I love that idea. Let's think about how we can work that into our lives. That would be a very fun challenge for us. It's good to be challenged with something like that because if, if you think back to school, isn't it easier um, when someone says to you, hey, can you write something, right? We're going to write for the next half hour. Can you write something uh, based on this question or this idea? It's much easier than just saying, you know, um, creative writing, you write whatever you want. Make sure you're done in half an hour. Then your brain, you know, starts going like um, in every direction. It's hard to focus and hard to choose. It's great to have an assignment like this where you think, ooh, plates of my life. Those are the plates of my life. I love it. Maureen, that's a great idea. Let's not forget that idea. I want to keep that one locked in there. Have a great afternoon, everybody. I will be, uh, I will be with you back on um, uh, Friday for Cocktail Night at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. But in the meantime, I'm just going to do the last bits of editing on the summer in Pennsylvania, the little um, cutting board project done in traditional punch. So this video is coming up. It'll be maybe half an hour, 45 minutes long. I'm speeding up a lot of it. So um, that'll be there later. And this product will be available pretty soon. I just need some time to spray paint these guys and get this done. But this is a great starter project and National Punch Needle Day is coming up this weekend. So it won't, it won't find you by this weekend. But if you get going with Punch Needle, uh, um, Pun National Punch Needle Day, I think is on s Saturday. I think it's on Saturday. I'll tell you on Friday for sure. Have a great tomorrow, everybody. I will be back with you on Friday. And, uh, and we will